situation. That is something that has to be dodged the worst. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on a Sunday evening for your yet another book event at the show club. As you know, these events are regularly organized by Mr. Jagdeep Singh and Mr. Ajay Singha. Unfortunately, Mr. Singha is not between us today owing to some personal reasons. But we have a very eminent personality with us today to grace the occasion with his presence. Someone whose columns and articles we all love reading, Mr. Jag Suraya. He is a columnist for the Times of India and the Economic Times, an author of several books including two anthologies of short stories, a collection of travel writing, an autobiography, and a remembrance of Calcutta. Among other honors in 1982, he became the first Asian to win the coveted Pacific Area Travel Association Gold Prize for travel writing. In 2017, the Shreyas Award, the Rotary Club of India's highest award, was conferred upon him for his contributions to journalism and literature. In 2020, he was awarded a knighthood in the Order of the Star of Italy for his extensive writing on the art, cuisine, and culture of La Bella Italia. Now may I request Ms. Shelza Singh, who is a renowned journalist here and has written a beautiful piece today on Mr. Suraya and his work, to welcome him with green greetings. subscribe to it. So 
right from that time onwards, when we were probably in the seventh or eighth standard, we were reading Jays, going through it, and lovers of us like pop music, Dabi Bhagat became the last word. His column discussion. Jacques has written in his book, I don't know how Dabi did it, but he would find a new pop group in India every week. He also mentions Flintstones in that. You know. And so, we, and Jays was, suddenly it became a phenomenon. It became the anthem for us youth. And there were new things happening. Now we find out from his book that actually there were only three people bringing out the magazine. The Dabi Bhagat was there, Jack was there, Papa Menin was there, and of course uh, uh, Desmond Doyle, who was the leader, who was the editor. Now what we get to know from his book, which we will discuss shortly, is that because they were short of staff, they started to engage with the audience, with the readers. So increasingly more and more readers started contributing to jazz, and that, I think, became a great reason for its success. And so we saw, we had, J any happening was known as jazz happening. There was quiz at jazz quiz. If there was vintage car rally uh, organized by the statesmen, there would be a jazz mobile. So there would be, you know, everything was. Uh, I was surprised to be when Desmond Doig died prematurely of a heart attack. He told Dabi, I think this is another JS happening. So, JS and ladies and gentlemen, I'll give you one personal before we get to the questions. I was in Jakarta for two years and two, three years I was there. When I came back after a gap of about six months, I got a shock in my life. My mother, what we call in the army, the condemnation drive, you know. And my mother, she had cleared away a lot of my old magazines. I didn't mind that she gave away the youth times. I didn't mind she gave away uh, some of my other magazines like The Sun. But the shock was that she had also sold the entire collection of J.S. I don't think I ever overcame that shock, you know. Which brings me now to Al Jazeera which has just come out with a long article in which, ladies and gentlemen, he is quoted Mr. Suraya Chak, I would like to tell you, and where he says that he was sitting in an office in Bombay, of, which used to be at one time the jail's office in Mumbai. And from there he got to know that there are some old issues lying off a magazine. He tried to find out which magazine was this, and it was the years. So he quietly gets them photocopied. One by one, one by one. He's got the entire collection. It's a very fascinating piece by Indal Jazeera. If you want, I'll forward it to you later. What I'm trying to say, ladies and gentlemen, is that after 45 years of a closure of a magazine, it's still being discussed. The Lusted Weekly closed. The Durham Youth closed. The Eve's Weekly closed, the Youth Times closed, the Debonair closed, the Imprint closed. No one talks about it. But even today, even now, people are talking, why did JS close? There was an entire generation, ladies and gentlemen, which grew up on JS. And I remember uh, three years ago, I was just reminding Bunny that I had written a long piece on my Facebook. Manju had also commented on it. Surita, a lot of others had commented, where I wondered where was Dabi and Bani had said he is in Nepal, late Dabi Bhagat now, he was in Nepal. And so she asked me, you should read this book to know more about J. So I always had it in mind that I have to get this book. I, I got this book and, well, I read it and it was published in 2011. This is another thing we are going to do. We don't have to call authors only who have recently published. We can call another any author. So it's not easily available by the publisher, but Amazon has it if you want a copy of it. They have, Amazon had a problem giving us the copies in bulk. It's against their policy. So all of you want a copy of this book, you'll, it's unputdownable. Jack says that you must read it in bits and pieces. But I would say I read it in one go and then I read it again. So that kind of an engrossing book it is.
Thank you, Jeff, for being here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So, right in the beginning, can you please tell us in your words, what is it that made JS tick? What was its USP, so to say? I think the USP of the JS was it acted as a mirror, which a mirror held up to the face of young people. And you'll have to keep this close. Okay. It is the audible at the back? It's a sound code. It seems to be on. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah, no. Okay. Okay, so as I was saying, the JS acted as a kind of mirror. It was the first time that young people in India could actually see a reflection of their aspirations, their hopes, their dreams, their anxieties, their fears. So this acted as an emotional and intellectual mirror for the young people of India, who before this had no such uh, uh, attempt at self-recognition. So you also said that Jairz filled a vacuum Yes. Because there was no teenage magazine at the time. Yes. Uh, you know, it was said that the young people were children and suddenly they were adults. There was no intervening period of experimentations, what you know, we call the teen years. Right. So there was no, so in that sense, the JS created the teenager, the Indian teenager. Okay. So, it also had this uh, logo, the magazine that thinks young. The magazine that thinks young, yes. Surprisingly, every week we used to get three magazines together. It was the JS, the Illustrated Weekly, when JS was a weekly then. JS, Illustrated Weekly and the Femina. And my father would first of all read the JS. <laughs> it wasn't exactly for the young. <laughs> Sir, about your name, Jack. Have you ever come across any other person named Jack? Uh, <laughs> no, not really. He, he tells us beautifully how his sister, otherwise he is, you know, he would have been Jagdish Suraya. You know, and if he had been Jagdish Suraya, I think he would have also been called Jack. So. <laughs> but his sister named him Jack. So please tell us about it. So my, my uh, sister, she was older than me by 10 years, uh, she was a great fan of uh, Archie comics. Now Archie's best friend uh, uh, was a chap called Jughead Jones, uh, who was extremely lazy and uh, uh, with a huge glutton, he used to keep eating hamburgers all the time. So I was pretty lazy and I was a glutton. So my sister decided to call me Jug after Jughead Jones. <laughs> okay. You just mentioned that in a TV bike that you were giving outside, that MJ Akbar came. She, she actually held, she and MJ Akbar, for a brief time, uh, there was, a, there was a, a, a Boy Scout and Girls Guide Jamboree held in Kalyani. Uh, which is about, I think it's about 80 kilometers from Calcutta, thereabouts. Uh, it was a dream city uh, planned by Dr. B.C. Roy, the then Chief Minister of Bengal. Somehow it never took off. But anyway, they were hosting this, uh, this, this great jamboree of Boy Scouts and Girl Guides. So the JS was invited to do a jamboree journal, which I think would come out every day for the duration of the jamboree, which I think was uh, 8 days or 10 days or something. So MJ Akbar and Bashi Karkarya teamed up and produced this uh, Jamboree journal. Uh, subsequently, both of them joined the Illustrated Weekly under Kushwan Singh and so they were colleagues for a while. So the, the nagging question which everyone keeps asking all the time is why did JS close down? Now JS, as he said, had become, it had filled the vacuum, it was required for a teenage magazine. It, I remember I became an English teacher, I still recall P. Lal's piece in JS, where he had written, I teach Shakespeare to those 
who can't put two words of English together and make a sentence. So when I started teaching English, I, it all came back to me. Just when your book came out in 1977, Homecoming, I think, I still remember the heading, when the book wrote its author. So JS was a magazine. I remember Dubby writing something that the Queen is more popular than the Beatles. And it created a few wrong. You know, it created so much of reaction that anyone could even try to point a finger at the Beatles. So there are a lot of things why JS closed down. But what we gather from his book is very simply that the Statesman magazine that owned the JS, they were at one point of time they started becoming jealous of this young upstart magazine which was creating such a big name. And that Desmond Doy, who was the leader and whom Jack admires so much, he's kind of his you know, demigod in journalism. And that I read in some place, maybe not in your book, where probably Mr. the MD of Statesman uh, also started getting jealous of Desmond Doy that he was becoming a bigger figure. And the Statesman magazine was also, their staff was also very unhappy that earlier they only had one cabin in the Statesman office, then they had a mezzanine floor, increasingly more people had joined chairs, and they got, he even writes when they got new Godrej tables, even the old state, Statesman staff were jealous of that. They, or if one of your uh, spouses wrote for a piece, they were saying that they're trying to make money by writing articles and things of that kind. So there were a lot of uh, things going on. So am I right to say, Jack, that JS magazine was killed by the statesman? Yes, well actually it was killed by petty mindedness. The smallness of people who thought they were very self-important but uh, who were just egomaniacs. Uh, the main culprit behind the closure of JS was the managing director of the Statesman newspaper, uh, uh, C.R. Irani. Uh, he, he made history of a sort because I think he was one of the youngest managing directors uh, in, uh, in, in, in the annals of corporate India. He became a managing director of the Statesman uh, at, I think at the age of uh, just about 42 or, or so. Uh, he, he, was a, he was a fascinating character in many ways. Uh, very bombastic in his speech. He used to dress in almost in, in something that looked like a, like a quasi-military uniform. Uh, he would wear a very dark colored safari suits. And he had all these funny looking uh, Apple things, uh, epaulets and all sorts of things, uh, sort of dangling, you know, down his chest. Uh, I think he wanted to give the impression of, of, of belonging to some sort of uh, not so secret militia, and he was waging a one-man battle against his arch foe, Indira Gandhi. The funny thing was that, like so many people who are bitter enemies to, towards each other. He was this, a mirror image of Indira Gandhi. <laughs> he was as big an egotist. He was as big a dictator, an authoritarian person. He, could, he, he couldn't brook any form of dissent. None at all. When he would, every now and then, he would take us, uh, people, you know, the members of the JS team, uh, out to Trinkers, which was one of the uh, uh, music spots of Calcutta, where Usha Uthup used to sing. Uh, Usha Uthup was one of uh, C.R. Irani's favorite uh, singers. And when we got there, and the waiters would produce menus, uh, Mr. Irani would say, there is no need for those. And he would order for everyone. And he would say, bring Ida Toast 12. And that was it. You couldn't, you couldn't say, but I, I don't want to eat Ida Toast. I'm allergic to whatever it was that Aida had to contain. You weren't allowed to say that. You had to eat it whether you liked it or not. 
Uh, I remember he took me at the, at the height of Jay Prakash Narayan's uh, movement against Indira Gandhi. Uh, uh, he took me to Patna to, to interview Jay Prakash uh, for the JS magazine. And uh, when the interview was over, Irani of course sat in on the interview. When the interview was over, he, he congratulated me. He said, he said a couple of nice things. And we went, uh, he he'd of course booked uh, rooms uh, and uh, a suite for himself, uh, a, sh a shared room for me with some, some, some flunky of his. Anyway, that was fine. I was also his flunky, so no problem. Uh, and he rang up room service. Without asking me what I wanted, he asked them, what is the best scotch whiskey you have? They told him something. He said, bring three doubles. Two doubles were put in front of me, one was put in front of him. It was made clear that this I was meant to drink this, whether I wanted it or not, I might have wanted a Coca-Cola, I might have wanted a rum and soda, I might have wanted anything else, but no. Two of the best scotch whiskies for me, one for him, and then dinner, which he ordered again, for himself and for myself. <laughs> so that is just to give you an idea of the kind of man he was. And he chose the statesman, as, as uh, Jack said, because there was a feeling that Desmond Doy, Desmond Doy was the absolute opposite of Sierra Gandhi. He was one of the most big-hearted, generous-hearted individuals I've ever met in my life. Uh, when his book, uh, he was also a, you know, a sketcher and an artist, so when his book, uh, called uh, An Artist's Impression of Calcutta came out. Uh, Desmond used to go around sketching the old buildings of Calcutta, you know, which were built during the British Raj, and which were fast disappearing. Most of them are gone today. So he would uh, sketch the building, a uh, pen and ink sketch, and write a very, very brief, just four or five hundred words, uh, background uh, about the building. And when his book was going to come out, and it's going to be an instant hater, a bestseller. He came to me and he said, will you do the foreword for me? I was an unknown writer, an obscurity. Why would he ask me? And he gave me my mind on that foreword. That was the kind of man he was. And so obviously he, he grew far, far more popular then a man like C.R. Irani, who was a pygmy in comparison to him. <laughs> uh, and C.R. Irani couldn't stand that. He couldn't abide it. That Desmond was a bigger public personality, a more engaging character than he was. So he did a, he closed the, he shut down the jails. We were in the middle of a print run. Desmond heard that the JS was being closed down, that the guillotine had fallen. He heard it from the printer of the statesman, who called him and said, JS, uh, Desmond, it's all over. JS is dead. And Desmond said, what are you talking about? He said, the battalion director, the MD, he stopped in the middle of the print run, without informing the editor, without informing anyone. And that was in August uh, 1977. Yeah, so uh, I remember if you read this book, uh, Jack becomes palpably emotional describing how J.S. died, you know, in the middle of the print run, and how Angel, you know, uh, the guy, the office boy, come and said, Sir, J.S. Bando gaya. He said, what, what are you talking this? It down, so. uh, talking about Mr. Irani and then the menu and the food that he used to order uniformly for everyone. He also ordered salmon sandwiches and bitter in London for all of you. And he said, how come some things never change? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that is the sad part. Uh, you know, uh, surprisingly I'm a great fan of Beatles and I always compare Beatles with the Jays. Beatles also closed like that. They started in 62, 70, they were kaput, finished. 
the greatest band, the biggest band, and here was the youth magazine with the Beatles on its front cover, first issue, 10 years, no one knew it would close like this. It's indeed a very sad story. And we are so glad that Mr. Jackson is with us today. His column, Rare Window, was read by everyone. Though it drove us to the dictionary sometimes, his penchant for using <laughs> very large words, which I'll come to that. Uh, yeah, you know, you, your shift from after JS closed, you always talk two ways. He calls statesmen the paper, T capital, P capital. And he calls Jains of Times of India as the family, T capital, F capital. And he calls Irani MD, M capital P. He doesn't name them ever. So when he's talking about the family, it's the Jains. When he's talking about the paper, it's the statesman. And he says newspapers like Times of India and Hindustan Times, there were nothing in front of statesmen at one time. So he feels that JS was the, I mean, statesman was that paper. So I think after JS closed down, it was a good break that you were offered uh, assistant editorship in the statesman. Uh, yes. So yeah. what was the transition like? Uh, well, I more or less had to uh, carve out uh, a role for myself. Uh, the, the editor of the Statesman at that time was a man called uh, Nihal Singh, uh, who, who was a very kind-hearted man, a very genial man. Uh, he was well disposed to his, to his colleagues. And, uh, so we were all sent up one by one. Those who wanted to stay, uh, Desmond had chosen not to stay with the statesman. He went off to, to Kathmandu in Nepal, uh, where he did a lot of things. He, he uh, uh, began to do a series of uh, write-ups and uh, sketches, uh, uh, an artist impression of Nepal, of Kathmandu. He began to design uh, gardens and restaurants for the five-star hotels in Kathmandu, which were just coming up. He was, he was doing a lot of things. Uh, uh, Dabi Bhagat joined in, so did uh, a couple of other people from the, from the JS. Uh, a, few, a few of the JS uh, team stayed behind. Uh, I, was, I was one of the few. And uh, the few that, who did stay behind were interviewed one by one by Nihal Singh, who, who tried to ease them and said, you know, we'll find something for you to do. Uh, I wasn't going to have that. I, I, I wanted to have a say. So uh, when I was called in for an interview with Nihal, I said, uh, Mr. Singh, uh, thank you for welcoming me uh, both the statesman. Uh, here is what I, I think I can do. I say I think the, the statesman is great with its news coverage, I think the statesman is great. It, it, its editorial page was unmatched, uh, not just in India, but I would say in all of Asia, uh, for the precision of the language used. Uh, as you said, I used to call it, I prefer to it as the paper, because the people who worked in the statesman says, uh, uh, we have no uh, competition, we only have contemporaries. There was no competition for the statesman. So the editorials were, were like chiseled diamonds. They were perfect. But I told Nihal saying this, I said, you know, it was perfect. One thing it lacks, you don't have a features page. <coughs> People want to read something that's behind the news, something about human lives, ordinary people's lives. So I said, what are you talking about? I said, I can do you a series by interviewing people whom we don't normally think about. The many faceless, hundreds of thousands of faceless people who make the city what it is, make Calcutta what it is. So he said, what are you talking about? I said, well, who do you think paints those signboards for Bollywood, the latest Bollywood release? How is it done? Who does it? Are these street artists? They're faceless. I'll go and interview them. I'll go and interview. In those days, we used to have the 
the Bandarwala, the monkey man. He'd have his dumru and he'd have two trained monkeys who we dress up in sort of, you know, dhoti, the male monkey, a little sort of gown or skirt and thing. I'll say, I'll, I'll interview this guy. How did he get into this? What's life for him like? Living. So I went around and I did a series called How the Other Half Lives. I, I wrote about the boat uh, on the river Hooghly who would take passengers and ferry them across the Hooghly or just take them for a pleasure ride right. in one of these boats. So I interviewed a lot of people like that and uh, then I went on to do other things about the, 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 the arts and crafts that were being forgotten. But where were sitars being made? Uh, the sweetmeats of it all. Uh, there was this sweetmeat which came to be called Lady Kinney. Lady Kinney was a corruption of Lady Canning, the Viceroy's wife, who happened to eat this somewhere. She liked it so much that uh, you know it became a favorite delicacy of hers, and so. They decided to name the sweet after her. And the place where it originated was a small little place called, I think, uh, Krishnapur. So, Bunny and I, uh, she very adventurously would uh, accompany me on these, uh, the, these explorations of mine. And so, we set off for this little village in a, in a hired taxi and we found this little place. And we, we traced the history of this very famous uh, sweetmeat from the world. So there were all these kind of stories. So I did this uh, uh, for I think a good uh, five or six years. Uh, and then I began to write editorials, which was my great dream to write editorials for the Stens uh, which I eventually did. Uh, so yes. It, 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 it taught me a lot about, uh, well, it taught me a lot about figuring out different slots for myself. It, it, uh, I discovered I, I could do many different kinds of writing. I could do feature writing. I could bring anonymous, faceless people to life by writing a short feature about them. Uh, I think uh, one of the one of the ones which had a great response was about the rickshawalas of Calcutta. Uh, uh, Nabudali was his name. And he was a, a real life person. And, and I wrote about him. And he visited me in my office. And uh, uh, when I wrote my uh, book on Calcutta, I started my book on Calcutta. It's called Riksha Ragtime. And it begins with my story about Nabudali. <coughs> And the stories he told me, uh, the most incredible story he told me <laughs> is that uh, it was monsoon time in Calcutta, it was raining, pelting cats and dogs, bears and tigers, whatever. And the famous footballer, Chini Goswami, had landed at Dumdum Airport and he needed to be dropped home, which was at the other side of the city. So, Nabudal pulled his rickshaw, there no side to rickshaw, hand pulled rickshaws with the famous footballer at the back. When the flood waters got too much for him, he began to come up over his knees. The great sportsman that he was, the footballer, jumped up. He said, you take a rest, I will pull you. And they took it in time to get him to his house. And Nabudali would tell me the story. And he would tell it with such sincerity that he made the story come true. Though it was only his dream, it was just a story. But the way he told it, it was true for him, he made it true for him. So talking about Calcutta, you started your thing by editing the letters to the editor, which was a very boring job. This was something when you read in the beginning of Cash 22, how he starts changing it. <laughs> so, uh, and then it's a very fascinating story how he graduates from editing the letters to the editor uh, to 
the third editorial and the second editorial you find also in Times of India. We'll come to that, of course. Uh, so, uh, before we move on to the Times of India in Delhi, uh, Jack, can you tell us what is so fascinating about Calcutta? You've written a book on Calcutta, I think Gunter Grass also wrote on Calcutta. So did, uh, I think, Dominic Lapier, wrote City of Joy. Amit Chaudhary has written on Calcutta. Rajiv Gandhi called it a dying city. It was also the city of every time Mohan Bagan and East Bengal play, whoever loses two, three people commit suicide. And it's a, it's a like a amazing, it's a, it's a pulsating with life, the city. So what is it about Calcutta that really fascinated you? I think Calcutta is the city of an extremely passionate city and it excites passions in people. You either love it or you hate it. You cannot be indifferent to Calcutta. You can't say, oh, it's just there, let's ignore it. You can't do it. Yeah, that is true about Calcutta. In fact, uh, last time, just before lockdown, I had gone to Calcutta and stayed at the Park Hotel, because right below the train cars and couple of other pubs now there. And I was surprised that the newspaper which was delivered to my hotel room and the newspaper I saw in some of the restaurants on Park Street was the Millennium Post. Neither the Statesman nor the Telegraph. We had thought Telegraph went upstairs to uh, Statesman and taken over. But this is the way it was so, it was so surprising. Uh, Sir, so you give a very fascinating account of how uh, Gautam Adhikari and Times of India start wooing you to move over to Times of India. And it takes you almost two years to decide, or a little less. Uh, yes, uh, almost two years. Two years, years, years to now. decide. So, uh, what mo motivated you ultimately to move from the paper yes. to a lesser paper? Okay, so actually uh, it was uh, thanks to, to Bane, my wife, uh, who's had a very, very illustrious uh, career in advertising. Uh, so uh, Bane uh, was uh, working for uh, Ogilvy and Mather, it was called Benson's in those days, and she was the, uh, the, the copy chief in the Calcutta office. And uh, Ogilvy and Mather, uh, as a native uh, came to be called, uh, they used to have this uh, training program, uh, international training program where, where people in all the, uh, I think they had offices in 68 countries, uh, Bunny would correct me, it might be a few more, I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, so people would, would, would attend these, uh, uh, I think it would, it would last 10 days or a fortnight, these workshops. So Bunny had attended one, uh, I think in, uh, Three. 82. 82. 82. 82. 82. Sorry. 82. And that was in Hong Kong. And uh, many years later, well, as a matter of fact, in 80, uh, 87, uh, Bunny was asked to actually organize one of these workshops uh, by the managing director, the then managing director of the uh, UBM Naver, Bunny uh, Ayer. Uh, so Bunny chose to do it. Uh, she said, I can't do it in Calcutta. Uh, it'll, it's, it's too chaotic because Calcutta was suffering terrible park cuts and all kinds of things. So she chose Kathmandu because uh, Bunny and I knew Kathmandu very well. Uh, we had a lot of friends there, Dabi Bhagat and others. Uh, and uh, we knew the Kathmandu scene very well. Uh, so uh, Bunny organized this and it, it went through without a hitch. And it was very, it was a very, uh, it was unusual because it was the first time that someone from the creative side of advertising, which Bunny was, had been asked to organize it. Normally, it was someone from the administrative side, uh, you know, from the management side. So Bunny, I was very, very impressed with Bunny uh, and uh, her managerial skills, uh, quite apart from her creative skills. So, on the last day of the conference, he very kindly he told Bunny. He said, uh, look, we've been working very hard uh, and we've been away from Jagpur uh, for, you know, this, 
14 days or whatever, why don't you ask him to fly over at our invitation? So I flew from Calcutta to Kathmandu, and he and I met Mani uh, uh, outside having a coffee uh, outside the hotel, and he told me, he said, uh, look. Uh, I hear that for the past one and a half years, yeah. you are under offer from the Times of India uh, to join them in Delhi. What you do is of course your business. All I'd like to tell you from our side is that if Bunny were to come to Delhi, we would welcome her with a promotion. The moment I heard about this, uh, Bunny came out uh, from, from the final session of the conference just about 30 minutes after that, I told her, I said, once when we get back to Calcutta, we are packing up, we are shifting to Delhi. And I told her that. So that's how we did it. Okay, great. So his move to Delhi is a very... You all must order this book in Amazon. You, you will not be able to put it down. And the shift to Times of India, where he's supposed to stay in the guest, of, guest house of Times of India. And the driver is taken to the house of the family. He says, where are you taking me, Sardar Patel Mahat? He says, the guest house is not, you know, the rooms are occupied, so that you're going to stay with the family. And it's a great story where the Jains don't drink and he has to quietly take a talk and go before the dinner. And, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I remember Anish Jung, who was the editor of the Youth Times, uh, writing that she had gone for one month training to the Times in London, and every day she would try and get a glimpse of the editor. And finally she managed to get a, it's so big, so sprawling. And the editors had no time for those who would come on training. And finally she manages to get a glimpse. And she written an editorial about how I managed to see the editor of Times. So when Jack joins Times of India, he finds Girilal Jain, also a bit of a pompous guy, who would not look to, you know, and he is the associate editor or assistant editor. And finally, he gets a book review published in the Harvard Book of Reviews. No, it, it was in the New York Review. Of New York Review. And Grilal Jain himself was an avid reader of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry, the New York Book Reviews. And, and then he sees Judd's piece on it. And he gives him a ring. So come to my cabin, I've seen your... He's scared that probably he's going to fire me for moonlighting or something, you know. But he goes there and he... And from there on, Grilal Jain starts increasingly more depending on... Increasingly depending on Jack, even asking him to go through his editorials. And so you start from the third editorial. The His description, he was a... Finally he became the editor of the editorial page. But his description, how he graduates from writing the third editorial to finally the second editorial and finally the main editorial. And who was the editor who rang you up that please add 150 words more to your editorial? He said it will not fit in the third editorial. He said no, this is the main editorial today. And that's how he got his first. Uh, that so that must have been very thrilling. No, that was the, uh, that was Grilla uh, uh, What had happened was that uh, for, uh, God, uh, Gorbachev was going to visit America. It was the end of the Cold War. It was the beginning of this uh, this entente between America and what used to be called the evil empire of the Soviet Union. And uh, so Gorbachev was going to uh, to America, uh, a bastion of capitalism, and already. Uh, there were little snippets in the news that uh, uh, New York City was going to prepare a ticker tape parade. This is a typical American thing where, you, you know, there's a cavalcade of cars and people throw this like confetti, you know. So this confetti trails of paper, paper floating through the air like a, snow, like a snowstorm. And uh, the big selling item was gobby dolls, small little <laughs> dolls, cute looking dolls with that bald patch of that, you know, that uh, birthmark on his head. So I said, this is typically America. They take the last standing, almost the last standing uh, fortress of communism 
and they turned it into a capitalist money-making idea by having a ticker tape parade by selling Gobi dolls. And I wrote it like that. And I meant it as a third editorial. And Green Lantern said, no. He said, I had 150 words. We run it in the top editorial. Because what you're talking about is the, the takeover of the communist ideology by a capitalist ideology. I mean, this is absolutely historic. Uh, you also got flagged from a lot of uh, old stuffy journalists for changing the content of the editorial pages. For instance, your lead editorial was when I think Madhuri Dixit got married. And <laughs> he took that as the lead because he wanted to bring about a change rather than write about the Kashmir problem all the time. Well, actually, it was uh, there had been uh, uh, some by election in, in Bihar. And uh, someone suggested we do uh, the lead editorial on that. I said, you know, quite frankly, these by elections, be they in Bihar or wherever, I'd rather give them the go by. You know, say bye bye to bye, bye elections. I said, Madhuri Dixit getting married. And my colleague Siddharth Vadraj, who now uh, is one of the editors of the Wire, which is an excellent uh, uh, online publication, said, You know, Jal, half the hearts in India will be broken. Of course, he was referring to the masculine hearts. <laughs> so, I said, You know, that's a fantastic opening line. Siddharth, he was a great fan of, he is a great fan of Madhuri Dixit. I said, You write the editorial, start with that line. And we run it as the first editor. And I think I made the right choice. Because, you know, the trouble with a lot of, I was the trouble with journalists, especially in those days, was that they would write for other journalists. They wanted to show, you know, how serious they were, how politically aware they were. Why write for other journalists? Why don't you write for the reader? Damn it, without the reader, he wouldn't exist. So, I had that editorial for the reader. I was more interested, either reader male or female, certainly more interested in Madhuri Dixit and a matrimony than in a by-election in India. Can you please tell us that when Princess Diana died in 1997, <laughs> his books begins from there is the editor of the editorial page of the Times of India. It's a Sunday and they are relaxing in the evening they have to go out for dinner somewhere and he's not aware, he doesn't watch TV, so he's not aware that Diana is dead. And in the evening he goes to his colleague for dinner and says, why are you all, you know, watching the TV so avidly? And they say, you don't know, we're watching the person who's dying, who's dying, Princess Diana. And next day, there is no editorial in the Times of India on the death of Diana. And I believe Samir Jain said, I will need very good reason why we missed out on the editorial. So, so, one minute. When Queen Elizabeth died three days ago, I looked at the Times of India editorial page. There was no editorial on Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe on the next day they carried it. I deliberately checked it. Okay, so uh, what happened was that I, I discovered quite by chance because we had gone over to my colleague's house uh, to dinner to the house of Subir Roy and uh, Subir was watching television and I, I discovered that this was about 9.30 in the evening. It was far too late. Uh, it was far too late for me to do an editorial. I could have written it but, uh, you know, the, 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 the editorial page is what they call one of the early pages. Uh, it goes to bed, it goes to the printer, uh, the earliest, so that the news pages you know, are up and later. So there was no chance of my doing the editorial that night. So the next day, in the morning, I sat down to write this wretched thing in the office. And Samir Jai came by the office. Uh, he didn't come into my little cubicle. He asked one of the colleagues who was in the outer office that there has to be a very good reason why the Times of India 
is the only major newspaper in the world not to have carried a top edit on the death of Princess Diana. So I was told this, I, I said, please inform the Vice Chairman of the Major that the Times of India does not believe in knee-jerk responses. <laughs> you know, sometimes I wonder how I lasted for 10 years as an editor of the edit page. How come they just didn't sack me? So, uh, what I find in your book is that the self-deprecation, you're always underplaying yourself. The title also says, it doesn't say a bird's eye view, it says a warm's eye view of journalism. So, is this deliberate or... You also said they don't, you don't read my book in one go and why did the publisher publish my book, I'm not sure. All the time you underplay, is it deliberate or is there a... Well, it's, it's, it's a part of uh, uh, my beliefs in what I call, uh, rather pompously, the ethics of human writing, particularly the ethics of satirization. Unless you're prepared to make fun of yourself, you have absolutely no right to make fun of anyone else. That's true, absolutely. And uh, one thing about uh, Desmond Doig, uh, sorry, uh, Gabi Bhagat's piece on the closer of JS, which is available on the Google if you go through. He writes that Desmond once told him, uh, Desmond had this habit of using love after every sentence. Uh, it is a honorific he used to use, you know. And he's asking uh, Dabi, uh, Dabi, why does Jug write such large, long words, difficult words, love? And Dabi say, well, Jug is like that only. So even in this book, uh, and I thought my English was pretty okay, and I had to, at least, there must be at least 15, 20 words where I had to check my thesaurus at home. So, is this a delivery of this words, even your uh, uh, review of homecoming at that time, it used the word bombastic language. I still remember some of the newspapers at that time. So, it, do, do these words come easily to you? Uh, yes, well, uh, 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 it was a very popular hobby called stamp collecting. People like to collect stamps. I like collecting words. Uh, if, you know, when people keep using the same word through repetition, uh, words become stale. It's like the same recipe over and over. Think of your favorite dish, dal makhani, or butter paneer, whatever. But if you were to have it every day, same recipe, exactly the same word, language is like that. You want to freshen it up, give it a new twist. Right. Uh, I will ask one last question and then we'll open it to the house. Uh, sir, can you tell us about your mechanics of writing? What is a good time when you write morning, evening, or whenever you feel like? And why have you still not got onto the computer uh, using a long hand? You're still writing with hand, is it? Yes. Can you please tell us? Firstly, what is your schedule of writing? You've written so many books. When do you write? When do you write your columns? And uh, are you still writing long distance? Okay. Uh, now, when you say, uh, what are my, what are my times of writing? Uh, that's very difficult because the actual using I, I, I use a pen to write with. Uh, the actual physical act of writing comes after a long process of mental writing. I do my mental writing as a man, you know, uh, I, I had the opportunity or I just happened to, some stray thought occurs to me and I begin to form uh, sentences, then paragraphs in my head. Actually putting those, putting that down on paper is the least part of it. And, uh, but I normally would do that uh, in the morning. But this process of mental writing 
uh, it happens all the time. Sometimes it happens, uh, you know, when you're just about waking up, you're still half asleep and half awake, suddenly uh, some thought will come in my head. And this, the, the, the process of mental writing will, will get it. So do you get up and write, jot it down, or you wait till the... Okay, so this has been a very fascinating discussion. Thank you for coming, sir. Thank you. Let me tell you that Jug and Bunny, they're so easy to contact. I just, you know, Kunal Majumdar is the editor of Times of India. I just asked him, do you have Jug's email? He gave it to me. I just sent a two line. And they are, you know, we've had so many guests who can be very... He's very I said, How you, when can I send you your flight ticket? He said, no, I'll just drive down. This our organizer can. He's very happy to stay in the club. And sir, so thank you very much. Thank, thank you for inviting us. And I, the house, it's open to the house. Anyone would like to ask a question, please? Sir, you have talked very eloquently about the death of Jays. Can it take the liberty of Knowing. Why did the statesman die? I think the, the, the statesman just died of old age. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, actually, there is really no such thing as old age. You are you're only as old as you convince yourself of that. But if you keep refreshing yourself with new ideas, with fresh blood, uh, I don't mean physical blood, but I mean intellectual blood, the blood of ideas, of viewpoints, of opinions, you won't get old. That's why the JS called itself, the motto of the JS was the magazine that thinks young. The statesman never thought young. The statesman, almost from its inception, thought old. And if you think old, you're going to die of old age sooner rather than later. Would you uh, like to give the credit to Akbar for introducing a fresh paper for Telegraph? Uh, no, uh, well, uh, the, 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 the publisher of the Telegraph, uh, Obik uh, Sarkar, used to say that he has no worry about the circulation of his and the success of his paper so long as Mr. C.R. Irani is the managing director of the state's bank. He assures the success. Mr. Irani will assure the success of Telegram. Jag, I have a card for the next time to have here. Uh, two questions that, uh, that I would it's not a question, in fact. In Jaipur, it's very popular in the forest office and the government office that once you wanted to come to Jaipur, you have to run Thambo, and you ask some of your friend in the government to arrange for your stay. So, what, what said that uh, the place where you were settled, when PN was told that Jaksarai Ara hai, then Ijam Akshatar Kardin. So, he put a jug and a fry in your room. <laughs> no, actually, I, I think what happened was that uh, the Jaipur edition of the Times of India, the resident editor, uh, one refresh my memory, but uh, who, who was a. Prabhu? JD? Yes. Kiel Prabhu. No, no, no. J.D. Sahibu? J.D. Sahibu. Yes. Anyway, it will come back. So anyway, so he contacted someone in the, in the forestry department or whatever. He sent a telegram that uh, Suraya is coming to, uh, to run the board. Please organize the accommodation. For some strange reason, uh, Sur Suraya's account, Suraya's got uh, translated as two young women are coming. <laughs> so they were looking for two young women. 
<laughs> well, there was one young woman, and there was this not very particularly young man over there. So there was that, that confusion was there and it got cleared. And the second was uh, you wrote a, a piece on it, which uh, I had not read it. And uh, Maharaj Jaising, who is the son of the Yapur Royal family, he told me that have you read Zakharaya's piece today? That how he was hukam thrice in, a, in one night. <laughs> Yes, actually, uh, this was, uh, uh, I was in uh, Jaipur at the invitation of Bane, who uh, in a role as uh, uh, creative director of Ogilvy and Medha, was actually filming uh, a wedding, you know, uh, a very elaborate uh, wedding which was taking place in Jaipur. Royal wedding. A, a royal wedding. Royal wedding, thank you. So, uh, and we were surrounded by royalties. I mean, it was like wall to wall Maharajas, not to mention Maharani's. Uh, and uh, every now and then, so yes, I would get summoned, I'd get, I'd get hukumed <laughs> to manifest myself, which I would do. Uh, sir, uh, in the newspaper fraternity, there is a uh, anecdote, goes, uh, anecdote that goes around that when Samir Jain joined Times of India, the editorial died. And did it happen in your time? Is it true? Can you shed some air? I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't quite understand it. When Samir Jain joined Times of India, the editorial died. Uh, no, not at all. Not at all. Uh, you see, when, uh, when Samir Jain uh, took over uh, from his father. Uh, at that time, the, the, the editor was uh, Iri Lalje. And uh, Samir felt that uh, he, he wanted, you know, we were talking about uh, publications, newspapers, magazines, uh, becoming old, becoming stale, unless there's an induction of new blood, fresh talent, fresh ideas. Samir Jain wanted to put together a new editorial team and he asked Gautam Adhikari. Gautam Adhikari, uh, I think, had been working at the Hindu newspaper and uh, Samir had got him to come over. And Gautam Adhikari had become like a Samir Jain's confidant, you know, uh, advisor, editorial advisor. So, uh, uh, Samir Jain tasked uh, Gautam Adhikari, he said, I want you to find 10 journalists who specialize in different fields, economics, politics, international affairs, so on and so forth, environment. And he said, and lastly but not leastly, I want someone who specializes in humor and satire. So he actually, uh, I think Samir Jain in many ways was instrumental in rejuvenating the, the editorial page of the Times of India because, because he got all these people in. Uh, because uh, the thing was that uh, Girilal Jain and Inder Malhotra, who was second in command to Girilal, I think, at that time, they would say, well, after us, you know, rather like Louis XIV. Um, after me, the deluge. He said, after us, there are no more journalists left. We are the, we are the last of a dying breed. And uh, Samir Jain wanted to prove them wrong. And he did. Can I want to ask a question? I have a question, sir. Yeah. I'm right at the back here. Okay. Um, you may not be able to see me, but I would like to uh, tell you. You're one of the reasons, I think your pieces taught me more about writing in the English language than anything that I learned in school and college, so I wanted to say that. I have a rather impertinent question I'd like to ask you. Uh, as a writer, I mean, you've written some of the most well-written and impressive pieces anyone's read in an entire generation. If you had to pick one piece that you would want to rewrite, which one would that be? Almost everything I've ever written. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
this happens all the time on television, that you, you are only allowed six sound bites. Beyond that, you lost the viewer. The person is not interested. You've got to sum everything up in six sound bites. So, when you have that kind of compression, all kind of nuance is lost. You know, you, you, an idea, particularly an idea as complex as India is, or, or what we think of India, can't be expressed in six sound bites. And if you do, you are doing an injustice to that concept, to that idea. All the nuances are lost. I, I think this is what is happening. There are a few oases in this desert, Islam. Uh, one of them I mentioned a little earlier, uh, where one of the editors is Siddharth Bhattaraj, one of my ex-colleagues. Uh, the other editor is Siddharth Bhattaraj, whom I also know and I've worked with on a couple of projects. Uh, the Wire is an excellent uh, online publication, uh, which, you, you know, which invites people to write at length, uh, you know, and on anything. Uh, uh, some friends of mine, a, a friend of mine, had written a lengthy travelogue, uh, for example. And so there are all kinds of, uh, uh, they have political pieces, there are, there are pieces on uh, uh, the economy. And it's, the war is very, very hard hitting. It's not afraid of confronting the establishment. So there are, uh, the print uh, uh, is another such uh, uh, you know, online publication. That I think is uh, Shekhar Gupta's. Maybe. So there are a couple of these. Uh, unfortunately, most of these uh, publications can't pay or pay very little. So unless it's a true labor of love, uh, they don't often uh, get a lot of professional writers. By professional writers, I mean writers like me. I have to make my livelihood by writing. So uh, I can't really afford to do pro bono work as such. Mr. Rajiv, yeah. uh, Hello. this will be the last question. After that, he is available during the tea. You can please interact with him and Bunny. Rajiv, please. Yes. Uh, I've been a very avid reader of your third editorial in Times of India. And uh, I tried to enrich my vocabulary by reading your editorial. One of the words which I attribute to your uh, writing was Susaget. You mentioned about Susaget way of life in Goa. So that was one word. Now that's my comment. Uh, my question to you is, what do you think about uh, the future of the publishing industry in India and over the world as a whole? Is it people say it's a dying industry and uh, the social media has taken over? Nobody is bothered about you know uh, reading books as per we uh, as we used to read in our days and the people are more comfortable on e-book uh, uh, e-books so do you think it's uh, really a dying industry now no no because i mean uh, why do we uh, exclude e-books uh, you know from, from from publishing that's also publishing uh, you know and it's it's just uh, uh, i'll tell you uh, both bunny and i uh, own kindles you know it's uh, you can get all these e-books. And the reason we did this is because uh, we are inveterate travelers. And when we travel, uh, we found, if you're traveling for a, a long stretch of time, six weeks or eight weeks, uh, e e each of us want to carry uh, something like five to six books. So if, when you're carting around, uh, you know, almost a dozen books, the suitcases become very heavy. So we, we find uh, Kindles, uh, are very, are very useful in the sense that they don't add much weight to your luggage, but uh, you know they give you a lot of literary heft you know, to, to read. So no, I, I, I don't think that uh, uh, publishing uh, in any form, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Rowling uh, uh, wrote, wrote, wrote the Harry Potter series, uh, which, uh, I mean, I think, as many adults or you know, people in their 30s and 40s and older read Harry Potter as do people who are you know, uh, in their uh, pre-teens or early teens. 
she, she's made history by, I think, becoming the first writer, the first writer ever, anywhere, to have made one billion pounds sterling just through the craft of writing. So if the publishing industry is dying, his death row seem to be pretty energetic. Yes. 